So with the genesis of the boarding school idea in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, how, how did that play out in Oklahoma? Well, there, is, there are schools established across the state. Of course, at that time, we're um, close up on 60 tribes that live within mm -hmm. the, the state of Oklahoma. Of course, it's not a state yet, right. but within Indian territories, Oklahoma territories. And including in that are small schools, including uh, Rainy Mountain Indian oh, School okay. um, in southwestern Oklahoma. We also have the establishment of, um, in addition to uh, secondary schools and primary schools, are also Bacon College in the 1880s gets established in Muskogee. This range of educational environments is really uh, stretched across the state and uh, many communities and their, the uh, Native American children are starting to be shifted in the late 19th century into a, a formal mm -hmm. in educational environment here in Oklahoma. A significant point that happens is that graduates of Carlisle Indian School, uh, Seneca students, um, come to Oklahoma under, uh, as employees of the Bureau of Indian Affairs in 1918. And they are going through and visiting all the federal schools that are overseen by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, basically uh, doing a checkup on whether these schools mm -hmm. are being effective in their education. One of the schools that they visit in 1918 is the Rainy Mountain Indian School. And at this school, they see that many of these Kiowa children are still using art prolifically to express themselves and to, do, to sort of um, Im imagine themselves into the 20th century as Native Americans. They make the recommendation at that time to the Bureau of Indian Affairs that more art classes should be taught. Wow. The Bureau of Indian Affairs ignores them. It doesn't become a policy, really, um, for quite a few years. But Susie Peters, who was a matron working for the Kiowa Agency in Anadarko, um, comes and visits Rainy Mountain School and sees these children, um, chief among them James Achai, who then she brings uh, over to, as a student, to uh, study at St. Patrick's Mission School mm -hmm. in Inadarko. And Susie Peters really assembles a group of students who are uh, very gifted as artists and um, helps them to, to gain uh, private lessons through Willie Blaze Lane, who is a landscape artist, private um, individual uh, artist living in Chickasha, Oklahoma, and they start receiving private art lessons. Susie Peters and Willie Blaze Lane then approach Os Oscar B. Jacobson, who in 1915 has only just established the School of Art here at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, and in the 20s, Willie Blaze Lane and Susie Peters, the matron who's organized mm -hmm. these Kiowa students and artists, uh, appeal to Jacobson to create an opportunity for these students to come to the university to study art. They haven't come through in the formal manner that other students did and Oscar Jacobson really felt it was important that they be able to work independent of European models of art. So he created a certificate program. So those five Kiowa artists come to the University of Oklahoma in 1926 to study as students of Oscar Jacobson. Those artists are Jack Hokey, Monroe Satok, Stephen Mopope, Spencer Asa, Lois Bogota Smokey. Now Lois Smokey comes, she's the youngest of them. They're all in their 20s, but as a young woman, Lois Smokey cannot leave the Kiowa community without a chaperone. Mm. And so her family, actually, her mother comes with her. Because her mother comes with her, they can't live in the dorms. And so they actually rent a house that becomes the Jacobson house. Uh, so they come to the university and uh, study. Uh, Lois Smokey, because of uh, family obligations, uh, she's only able to stay for really just one semester. And she's replaced by James Achai. And James Achai and the other four men become known uh, largely as the Kiowa Five. Okay. So he comes in 1927. And by 1929, uh, Jane, uh, Oscar Jacobson is working with people in Europe and they actually publish a portfolio of images made by these artists uh, that is called Kiowa Art. These images are two-dimensional, they're flat, they don't present any kind of uh, a perspective, and they're all representing images of daily Kiowa life prior to the removal. And so that's a very important thing, is that they're looking historically and at a very recent past uh, of depicting images of their own community. So it's interesting that once again we see how a tool of assimilation and forced culture change ultimately adapts and because of native creativity and ingenuity 
becomes a tool to extend Indian culture and to enrich it and to preserve it and, and perpetuate it into the future. I think truly what you're saying is the truth. The, the, the arts have always been a means by which native cultures have expressed themselves and recorded their knowledge. And so while the studio environments may not have had any idea of that long mm -hmm. history, they certainly created an opportunity for these artists to be uh, recording their, their knowledge into images. And this is really the beginning of the studio arts. Wow. So again, this is just a, another piece of, of an amazing story of the native peoples of Oklahoma.